Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us out on this evening. We thank you for watching over us, caring for us, uh, providing and giving direction as well. Father, we pray you'd speak to us through your word tonight. Help us to uh, think of uh, ways that you've helped us in the past week so we can share those and, and other blessings that you've uh, provided us with. And for the prayer requests that we'll mention later tonight, I pray that you would uh, help us to be honest and help us to uh, bring all of our concerns, all of our prayer uh, request to you, uh, knowing that you hear us and you will answer our prayers according to your perfect will. So, Father, we thank you. We pray for your blessing tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Good evening. Uh, this is from uh, Brother Davilius. He's our missionary in, in Haiti. He usually sends us a very short uh, update. <laughs> this is uh, March 6, 2024. Uh, greetings in Jesus, is Jesus and our God. Uh, blessed be to God. In the beginning of this new year, 2024, our family and our congregation are happy to contemplate the goodness of God. We hope that you are all doing well in the Lord. We are sending our grateful thanks to you for your continuous monthly support and your prayer. Thank you very much. May God bless you and may he bless America. Please continue to 
Keep us in your prayers for our family, <clears throat> our congregation, the church in Haiti, and for Haiti as a country, especially Haiti as a country, from what uh, we know what's going on today. Easter season is coming, and uh, we pray that we had a, a good Easter. Uh, stay blessed in Jesus. Uh, Brother uh, uh, um, and um, that was um, Davilius and, uh, and Daphne. So um, that was from him. I also want to give you an update. If you remember last week, I wrote, uh, I read a letter from the Matinees where they had the serious wa water problem. And I mentioned that our mission fund sent $1,000 for that. And I did send uh, an, an email to them to let them know that we were sending that. And um, we got a very good a, a response. And I thought it would be good to, for you all to hear the follow-up to that. Dear friends, April 9, 2024, and it was not, not just our church, but there were other churches that also responded to, to the need there. We are absolutely amazed at the response from so many of you concerning the situation we face with the water supply. It's just amazing. We, we just take um, that water we get for granted, you know. Thank you for responding so generously to our request for help with this matter. The funds that have been sent in and pledged up to this point are enough to cover the cost for the immediate need for water and the cost of the backup system you know, to supply our church and the local community when needed. The backup uh, water supply will be installed this week. Unfor unfortunately, the water situation is still very dire. Most of our town still continues to struggle with no water or inconsistent water supply. The southern part of our town just recovered from no water for nine days. The reservoir that supplies our part of the city ran completely dry yesterday, but the municipality was able to source spare parts quickly and get the water flowing by nightfall. Today, the north end of the town uh, was, bone, was bone dry, and they are still trying to figure out what's wrong. Our part of the south coast requires 100 megaliters per day Currently, it's 80 megaliters per day is their max. This is a root cause of the issue as well as a lack of maintenance, infrastructure, lack of forward planning to accommodate the booming uh, urban growth, which means higher demand for water to the homes and businesses. All of these factors have played a part in, in the diminished uh, supply, and it also means that we will deal with this problem for the foreseeable future. A new dam and reservoir that were planned to be built are already six years behind schedule. Of course, having no water results in other issues uh, to face. Currently, there are over 20,000 cases of pink eye in our area uh, alone due to that many have no water to properly wash their hands. The aging sewage infrastructure in our town has resulted in sewage freely flowing in our streets and in the rivers, and of course, it's made its way to the ocean. This also contributes to uh, a, major, a major problem, not only to mention the trash that was piling up for weeks uh, due to a, a strike, which caused every type of flying and crawling creature to show up. Please continue to pray for us as we face these issues head on and try our best to encourage our neighbors and those all around us with the good news that, that, that has eternal results, the gospel. God continues to bless with folks being saved and baptized in spite of the deteriorating conditions. We are so thankful we serve a faithful God. Again, we appreciate you helping us in this matter. We are so thankful for God, for all of you, in Christ, John and Crystal Matney. <clears throat> All right, well, good evening, everyone. 
So I had to chuckle when David read that, the part about all the flying things of every sort. That's not that it's funny, but that's a challenge. Okay, sorry. Flying thing the other day during the uh, eclipse. I noticed it was nice and warm, and I said, oh, it's a beautiful spring day. The minute I say that, the mosquitoes come out, you know, as if they were waiting to jump. And then, you know, it dropped 10 or 15 degrees, and then they went away, so it wasn't too bad. But, you know, one nice day without bugs flying around would be fantastic. But anyway, so we'll be in Second Peter tonight, and uh, we'll start with Second Peter chapter 2. Um, as you're turning there... I'm going to start reading towards the end of First, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, just so we can get an idea of the context of uh, what Peter had for us. Title for tonight is False Prophets, False Preachers, and False Teachers. All three of those together. Peter touches on those. Peter goes into some pretty good detail uh, about those. So <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 2, and uh, before we, we begin, let's uh, jump in and ask for the uh, Lord's help with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for tonight. We pray that you would give us good, um, give us good learning. Help us to heed your word. Help us to be on the lookout for uh, the false teachers and false preachers in the world. Father, help us to avoid them. Help us to understand uh, what they're trying to do, so we can avoid it. And help us instead to focus on your word, uh, doing the things you tell us to do, so we can be a help to others. Father, we thank you, and we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. So we'll take a look. Uh, we'll start with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. And it's a pretty familiar passage, but the Bible says here, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's making reference to the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter, James, and John were there. It was an excellent, excellent time. Um, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts." Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So without that, for us to jump into you know, chapter 2, verse 1, but there were false prophets also, you lose a whole lot of the context. This lays out what you know, Peter's going to talk about for the next chapter. He says, look, Peter, James, and I, or Peter, James, and John, rather, were there. We saw the whole thing happen before us. We heard the voice of God the Father say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he goes, but don't listen to us. Take God's word, a more sure word of prophecy, over our firsthand experience. But by the way, we were still there, and we were just telling what we saw, right? So he's leading into it, saying there's going to be people that come and say, I have a, a grand new revelation for you, you know. If Daryl has a new revelation, and Brian has a new revelation, and Mike, I'm sure, has a couple new revelations, that might create for an interesting service, right? But we should, in fact, point to God's word and make sure, you know, God can reveal some things to us through scripture, but it's not going to be a new scripture to add on top of it. There's other organizations called cults that do that. They'll find something and say, hey, look at this new doctrine that I found. And, you know, you want to avoid that very much. So... We'll see here a quick summary. Uh, Peter is saying, we didn't make this up. Instead, we speak of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's beloved son. He says, even though we were present, we still have this more sure word of prophecy. And he goes, you would do well to take heed to God's word. We have on the highway, they have these neat little signs and it shows, it's a caution sign. It's a recommendation how fast to go around an exit. And you might look at it in the summer and say, well, why would I do 40 miles an hour through this? It's bone dry. I can do 75 easy. At least that's what I've heard somebody say, Joan. <laughs> but, you know, the recommendation is for safety year round, right? In the winter, when you have, you know, driving snow coming out your windshield, don't try to do 40 miles an hour. 
It's a, a recommendation to help you get through. And Peter here offers the same thing. He says, you'd be very well to listen to this. You'd, you'd do well to, to heed God's word here. He says we would do well to heed God's word and to make sure, in fact, that it is God's word that we are listening to. It's not our job to make God's word say what we want, but it is our job to do what God's word says. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, Do what God's word says by understanding it, by comparing it to other scriptures. And why is it so important? It's important because we don't live in a vacuum. It would be nice to just be able to live in a vacuum once in a while and having the actions of others not have an immediate and long-term consequence on you, but we don't have that luxury here. We have, you know, there's, we have to be um, on the defensive because other people will have things that they want to do that are going to impact us. Ephesians chapter 6 speaks of putting on the whole armor of God. Now, why do you think we need a whole armor of God? To resist the wiles of the devil, and they come in many different uh, facets and forms. But he says here, uh, it includes a breastplate of righteousness. And why do I bring that up? Well, a breastplate was designed to protect your vital organs. And while they did make ones later on that would cover the back as well, it was more of a cover your front, right? So you might have heard the, the saying, maybe you're going into a meeting, and the saying is, wear your Kevlar vest on backwards. Well, why would you do that? Because you have to watch your back in some areas. And the sad part is, with false teachers and false preachers and false prophets, you have to watch your back in the church. Not this church in particular, but in Christianity in general. You can't just go to the bookstore and, hey, this book says Christ. That must be a good book, you know? I, my eyes were really opened down in Florida. Uh, upstate New York, if you have a Christian bookstore, you probably have Christian books in it. But in Florida, there's a very wide variety of what passes for Christian. There's all types, there's all colors of the rainbow, and there's some of that too uh, in there. And it was interesting, there was one uh, version of the Bible called The Message, and it's a very, very loose version. And I picked it up just for fun to say, I wonder if I can find Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I did, but it took a little while. You know, it wasn't the typical chapter and verse format that we come to expect from the last 2,000 years, you know. It was, it was unique. And I'm not sure what the target audience was for it. I don't think I want to know or meet the audience, but it was just proving to you that there's a lot of false stuff out there. There's a lot of things that they think they're trying to be new and improved, but really it's worse and you shouldn't even go near it. So the point is here, it seems funny that you could wear your flak jacket backwards until you realize that it's good advice and sometimes you have to watch your back because you can't see your back. And it's a, a tough age that we live in today. There's you know, false prophets, there's false teachers, and they're coming from all angles. So you can't just say, ha, huh, I found one over here. Well, you found one, what about the other five over here? It's, a, it's comparable to being a, a border guard at the southern border. Hey, we found a false prophet, uh-oh. You know, and they're just washing right through. It's not funny at all. But take a look now at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Peter starts out by saying, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or privately uh, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's a, a tractor trailer company out there called Swift. And there's a, I think there's a YouTube channel that's called Swift of YouTube. And it identifies Swift as people that hire the absolute worst drivers because some of the things that the trucks end up in, you think, how in the world did they possibly get there? You know, they're off the road, they're, they're up guide wire poles and, you know, so if you need a job and you can't find anything else and you want to drive a truck, Sharon, go for it. You know, go work for Swift, they'll probably hire you. Don't have a license, don't, that's fine, you know. But, yeah, there you go. But I, I, I heard those two words, and I'm thinking swift destruction. It's not quite what they had in mind, but the idea is their destruction is going to happen very quickly. And it's going to be often a public destruction because they're, they're you know, doing this uh, falsehood in the public light. So just the, look at the word prophet right there, false prophet. The Greek word for that is pseudo prophetes, pseudo. It really lays it out for you there. Pseudo, fake, right? Fake prophet. And it's one thing if they're a fake prophet, but they're also putting out fake doctrine, false doctrine. 
And who's the first one that they deny as a false prophet? They deny Christ, right? And you might look at false teachers and you know, false preachers and uh, false prophets, and I would say that's different than moral failure. You can have somebody that's trying their best to be a, a teacher and they have a moral failure, but they're not going against God's word in their preaching. They're not you know, actively saying, you know, Christ, you know, all these things that they can say. I would put them in a separate category, you know, pray for them too, but they're not actively trying to lead somebody astray. Where here, you know, pseudo prophetes, they're actively trying to lead somebody astray. Now, we don't like imitation, unless you like imitation crab meat, right? I've always thought it was clever. It says, this dish is made with real imitation crab meat. Well, can we just have some lobster? I'll pay extra for it. It's one thing when they come out and say, this is fake, this is imitation. If you go to New York City and somebody offers you a Rolex you know, for less than $3,000, be prepared, it might not be real. And that Gucci handbag that you have, it also probably isn't real, right? But if you only pay $20 for it, are you expecting it to be real? However, if you go to a boutique store in Beverly Hills and you come across a you know, Gucci bag or a Rolex, I don't know, I'm making this up, the price is going to be very high, and then if you find out later on that it's fake, how upset are you going to be? You're going to be very upset because you've been scammed. You've been sold a bill of goods, and it only gets worse when you do that you know, in the, the Christian realm here. So he makes the warning. He says, you know, there are false teachers, and they're, going, they're trying to bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. When people start denying the Lord, that's the big, big problem. You know, there's room within Christianity for different preferences, but we all have to be agreed on the basic fundamental doctrines. Otherwise, don't call yourself a Christian because you're not helping the cause of Christ. It's a sad thing when folks deny the Lord. They start by denying the power of God to salvation. We've been talking about this a little bit in Sunday school with different social justice movements, and they use words that we would agree with. Is God for justice? Yes, he is. Is God for equity? Sure, he's for equity. But then they redefine it and they twist things and then they try to embrace it and say, well, your church can't be a God-honoring church unless you're involved in these social programs. <laughs> well, scratch your head. Where, does that, where is that found in God's word? And it's not. And they twist it and they try to make the, the conservative Christian look like the outlier, look like the, the strange one when in fact they're the one that twist it. So we see that there's a lot of you know, bad things, uh, damnable heresies. I don't really have to go into detail too much on what a damnable heresy is. It's very, very bad. Uh, if we look at verse 2 and 3, we'll see you know, what happens next here. The Bible says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. And that's why one reason why false teachers and preachers and prophets are so bad. They're not just hurting themselves, they're bringing others down with them. And they sneak in, you know, people that see them run to them unawares, and they get enticed by their, by their words. They get enticed by their action. They may even get enticed by their message. You know, if there's one church that says, hey, you know, follow God's word, follow God's commandments, and then this other one comes in, hey, I have a new message for you, brother. Oh, a new message, great, tell me more. And if someone is immature in the faith, they might get drawn away. They might look and say, oh, well, that, that old-fashioned Christianity, that's, that's hard. These commandments, uh, I like best practices better, right? And what happens is they get led away, and they find themselves not in a good spot. We'll leave it there. Uh, verse 2 and verse 3, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Perdition, or sorry, pernicious sounds like perdition, but it means utter destruction in reference to vessels, uh, ruins the destruction which consists of eternal misery and hell. Pretty descriptive. So this is where they're being led to. They're following their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Wow. So you follow somebody who's saying, forget what you've heard over there, come with me, right? And it'll be a lot better. And one of the problems of many in modern psychology today is the first thing they do is try to eliminate guilt. And guilt isn't good, but if guilt, you know, godliness, uh, godly sorrow leadeth to, re to repentance, right? Guilt can be helpful getting somebody's attention. But what they try to do is they try to erase that and say, oh, well, remove anything that would point you to a feeling of guilt. That's a terrible, terrible thing. 
And if they try to push Christ out of there, they push the Bible out, and then they have a clean slate where they can say, now focus on this, and they get into their philosophies and, and things like that. There are some areas where psychology can be helpful, you know, when it aligns with scripture, when it helps us to understand why people do the things they do. That's fine, because it's not going against God's word. It's not actively trying to destroy Christ's message. So we see here what happens. They're destroying things that are, uh, by who? They're, they're speaking evil of things that they really should not be speaking evil of. Verse number three, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Consider some of the words used in these verses. Destruction, uh, through covetousness, feigned words, make merchandise of. It sounds like somebody comes in and gets somebody unawares, gets them to follow along, uses them for their intended purpose, and then they get destroyed and they don't care. Mm -hmm. It's election season, so be advised, right? They're going to come in, make promises. Hey, we'll do whatever you want. We'll pander to the group and then pander to that group. And then what happens? You cast a vote and do you ever see them again? Sometimes you do, but for the most part. So you have to be really uh, paying attention and understand of the things around you. And that's in the world in general. We would hope that there would be a higher standard in Christianity. Uh, I've shared this before. When I went to PCC, it was, I said to my pastor, I'm like, oh, it'll be so nice. I can go let my guard down. And he looked at me like I had three heads. He goes, no. And I'm, what? Like, it's a Christian college. It'll be great. I can, you know, we have the walls around the college that acts like a defense, right? I wish. But even in a Christian college, there's people that were sent there or, you know, their purpose was to lead somebody else away. So we always have to be on guard. We have to know scripture and we have to be cognizant of those that are around us. He says these, all, these, all, these things, the, uh, the feigned words make merchandise of, they all speak of someone who is very proud and hungry for power and dominion, pretending to care for or love you, so you are enticed to join them, um, where you'll then be used before being eternally destroyed. In many ways, this is an honest evaluation of sin, and James reminds us not to err in this manner because lust leads unto sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death, right? And Clearly, Peter doesn't want that for us. God definitely doesn't want that for us. Back to 2 Peter uh, 2, verse 3, Peter finishes the verse with a warning to false teachers in particular. He says, their judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So if something doesn't linger, that means it's going to happen very quickly. If something doesn't slumber, they're going to be, there's going to be a reaction very, very soon. Understand the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, and he will certainly deliver. In this case, Peter is reminding that God's general judgment will come soon, and his specific judgment on these false teachers and their damnation <clears throat> is not going to be avoided. It's not going to be delayed much further, or it's not going to be forgotten. God takes care of his own. He takes care of his word, and he doesn't appreciate either of those being messed with. Very truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we see here, what's next? Uh, we see God uses the example of the rebellion of Lucifer and certain angels as an Old Testament example and a reminder uh, for us to learn from. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness uh, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for the righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the, flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Uh, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now if you look at those verses, I believe uh, verse 4 through 9 is all one sentence. There's semicolons, there's colons, there's a lot of ands. I was kind of having fun with that, and, and, and. But he gives us a lot of examples to look at. He goes, this wasn't just an isolated incident. 
Satan and the fallen angels are one, you know, great example of the terrible variety. But then look at why was the world judged? Well, because the world was wicked and sinful. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah judged? Because Sodom and Gomorrah was wicked and sinful. Do you see a pattern here? God's judgment might have taken a little bit, but when it came, it came fully and it came completely for our end sample. And I love the word end sample because it's from within our own group. It's not looking out at the X sample, out of. It's looking at our own group inside. You know, you can do that with your medical history. You can say, gee, did, did mom have, you know, high blood pressure? Did dad have cholesterol? You know, the, the national standard might be one thing, but if your family history is higher, then you probably better put the bagel down. You probably better put the donuts down, right? You look at your own in sample to get a better idea of what it is you're facing personally. Same thing for us here. He wants us to learn from the end sample of the Old Testament. A um, couple notes on what some of the uh, things were in verse number 10 here. Not afraid to speak evil of dignities relates to speaking evil or against things of God in Christ. Similar to profaning God's name or blaspheming, it's often done from a position of pride or a position of foolishness or both. I would rather, I guess, deal with somebody that's a foolish person instead of a proud person because at least you have hope of trying to get them on the right track. But when you combine pride and foolishness together, stand back, because it's going to be a mess. Um, in this passage, Peter reminds that many of the angels who rebelled with Lucifer have not been spared, but were cast down to hell and remain in chains until the judgment. Peter then references as an ensample the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as judgment and punishment for wickedness. So a quick reminder here that gives some color about the relationship of angels to man. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can just read right through this and, oh, yeah, that's great. But we should stop and think about it for a minute. Man is made in the image of God, Genesis 126. Angels are not. Satan and his angels resented this plan to create a being that would be more closely connected to God than they were. Though, man, or, let's see, though mankind is beneath the angels in dignity, uh, Hebrews 2.6 uh, it is the job of angels to serve mankind, Hebrews 1.14 and others. Uh, Satan and his angels resented a plan that would command them to serve lesser beings. There's the pride coming in once again. Uh, redeemed mankind will be lifted in honor and status above all angelic beings, 1 Corinthians 6.3. Satan and his angels resented a plan that would glorify these lower beings to places above them. So pride combined with foolishness equals rebellion, and that's a very hard thing to come back from. This is pride and the cause of Satan's uh, and the angel's punishment and eventual total destruction. From verse 9, we see the Lord knows how to both deliver and to destroy. And I want to share a quick quote with you here. The Lord knows how. If you get nothing else from the message tonight, remember those words. The Lord knows how. It's, it's great to be brought up on our you know, prayer service, on a Wednesday night prayer service and Bible study, because does the Lord know how to handle this situation? The Lord knows how. We see here, we can take great confidence in this, uh, understanding that the Lord knows how. Many times we do not know how, but the Lord knows how. This is a good principle for both life and doctrine. And here's the quote. For instance, sometimes we meet with perplexing doctrines. We don't understand the whole thing. Perplexing doctrines, perhaps we endeavor to effect reconciliation you know, bring it together between the predestination of God and the freedom of human action. It is better not to wade too far into those deep waters, lest we lose ourselves in an abyss. The Lord knoweth. And you know who said that? Charles Spurgeon. Everybody likes to say, oh, he's a Calvinist, and I, you know, they say he even said he was a Calvinist. Well, he even, if he said he was a Calvinist, he has a very honest conclusion here. He goes, we ought not to get too deep into those things because we're going to find ourselves in a lot of confusion. We're going to waste time when our focus should be on winning souls, not arguments. And he goes, the Lord knoweth. So be content with that and get back to doing what you're supposed to do, witnessing, sharing the gospel. I love hearing it from him, especially when you know, everybody chalks him up as a, a staunch Calvinist, right? If he, as a Calvinist understands that he that wins the souls is wise, then we should do the same thing ourselves. So we'll keep moving on. Uh, verse number 11, wherein angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. 
This is a contrast between angels who, being more powerful than man, could bring a railing accusation against the evildoer, but choose not to. In comparison to the evildoer who, in the flesh, rants and rages and ravages. So he's trying to show us here, don't be like these evil, wicked people. Don't be a false teacher. Don't be a false prophet. Understand judgment is coming, and it will come quickly and fully and finitely, so stay far away. To simplify uh, the thought of what I just uh, shared, uh, think of a big St. Bernard. Big dog, probably drools a lot, so you want to keep it out of your house, keep it in the yard. And then you have a little yipper dog, a little shih tzu or you know, tiny little thing. The St. Bernard is a true and faithful dog. You know, Think of it as the angel. The little yipper dog runs around barking, causing a scene. Which one of those could destroy the other with one fell swoop? Right? The St. Bernard could easily quash the yipper, but he lets the yipper go because the yipper is bound for destruction and has resisted efforts and direction towards reconciliation. So the little dog's going to you know, back and forth, and the St. Bernard will just sit there and watch it. Are you done? Are you done? You're done, right? And we can try to intervene. We should try to intervene as best we can with people. If, you know, if we see somebody accidentally saying something they shouldn't, doctrinally wise, then go to them in private and share with them and say, hey, you know, did you mean to say this? And you know, if they double down and say, absolutely, well, then that's a problem. Mark them and you know, try to reconcile best you can. But if they're bound and determined to go against God's word and outright heresy, then mark them so you can avoid them. Verses 12 through 16 describe more fully the character, uh, hidden or made manifest character of the false teacher. In verse 12, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery uh, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Do they have your attention yet? Some of the things that he, he mentioned, you know, there's just loving unrighteous, loving the reward of unrighteousness. It's not accidental. You know, it's, it's not, oh, I got up one Sunday and accidentally said something. No, this is like a train, it's a, it's a train track going to a destination. They're aware of where it's going, and instead of trying to jump off the back or disconnect the car, they go right up to the engine room and say, full power ahead. It's, it's crazy. When I think of a natural brute beast, I think of a wild boar running around, destroying everything in sight. Many governments allow people to go shoot wild boars. They encourage them. They have a bounty on their head because they recognize how damaging they are, how destructive they are, and they realize even if you go kill as many as you can see, the things reproduce faster than bunny rabbits, and it's just a, a cha terrible challenge to try to face. But they don't back down from trying to face the challenge. They're out there trying to destroy these natural brute beasts. Why? Because they recognize the damage that these brute beasts can do. Why are false teachers so bad? Because they often are not honest. At, you know, at least a wild boar, the wild boar, you say, what are you doing? And it, grunt, 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 grunt. <sighs> food, food, food. Right? And then you know what it's going to do because it's a wild boar. But a false teacher, they will come in and try to sneak in. And they'll say, you know, hath, not, or hath God not said? Right? That's the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking of a false teacher. Um, it says here, they beguile unstable souls. They go after the weak ones. They go after the ones who don't know much. They go after the ones that are maybe so stressed out by life that, oh, hey, you're being nice to me. I'll talk to you. I'll listen to you. And before you know it, they get drawn away. Having forsaken the right way, now gone astray and willfully follow the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. We shouldn't love unrighteousness, period. But they not only love the wages of, un of unrighteousness, they all also want the dividends. Hey, we need more dividends here. You know, you just you got to look and say, why would you go down this road here? Scripture offers multiple warnings about not leading others astray. 
Uh, one is Matthew 18, uh, verses 3 through 7. Uh, Jesus speaking and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. So Jesus is talking about coming to him with childlike faith, right? And the, the false teacher, the false preacher, the false uh, prophet is trying to prevent people from coming to Jesus, to actively to destroy that. And as we just said here, you know, Jesus says, look, there's going to be offense in the world, but woe unto him that causes it. And if you ever think of a millstone, a millstone, I looked it up, is about 3,300 pounds. That's the weight of a Toyota Camry Honda Accord. You know, I, we brought this up in college in class one day, and we were just happened to go through the verse. I raised my hand and said, wouldn't that break his neck first? And the teacher says, yes, Peter, it would, it would break his neck. It, this is, the picture here is total destruction. I'm going to throw this thing, you know, hook it to your neck. It's going to break your neck immediately. And then I'm going to throw you in the deepest part of the sea. Is that a little bit of showing how much this angers the Lord, you know, because you offended one of his little ones, because you try to cause him to astray? Okay, you're, you can try that, but know that it's not going to end well for you. And there's nothing that is going to happen to try to bring you back from your drowning with a millstone. It's, a, it's a, quite the picture of you know, how, how um, Jesus feels about those who try to take his children away, take his you know, followers away. And sometimes you know, we, have, um, we have not the easy message. Here we see if somebody comes to Christ, they must humble themselves. And that's what Satan didn't want to do. That's what these false preachers and teachers don't want to do. John the Baptist rightly said, he must increase and I must decrease. He was willing to continue on and be helpful in the cause of Christ. Uh, from the depth, the deception or destruction is where somebody's going to end up if they continue down that path of uh, being a false teacher. Just in case we are unclear, Peter continues in verses 17 through 20. He calls... These are characteristics of the false teacher. They are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. He continues, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean uh, escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for, a man, for whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bond, in bondage. Uh, for if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse, uh, worse than, than the beginning. So think about where they end up. They would have been better off just not even coming near the realm of Christianity, and I speak you know, figuratively there, than to come in to do the things they did and be ultimately destroyed. I can think of the faces of a few televangelists that I would you know, really hope that they're maybe reading this part of the New Testament sometime, anytime, right? And I'm not disrespecting televangelists in general. There's a lot of you know, very good ones out there. Definitely a lot of uh, quality evangelists too. But you can tell quality by their message. Do they proclaim Christ as the only way to heaven? Do they claim him as the Messiah? Do they support his work, his ministry, and you know, all, the, uh, all that the Bible says? Are they trying to prop themselves up, or are they propping up Christ? If somebody is propping themselves up, if all the attention is always, yeah, Jesus was great, but look what I did this week, then that's a good indicator of you know, where their motives are. They may be heading in the direction of false prophet, false teacher, and then once they have you hooked, you really got to be careful. So, you know, use discretion when you, when you watch people, watch videos. Use discretion when you're thinking about, you know, oh, that guy's a great, well, is he? Well, and I say use discretion because that'll help you have a solid understanding. You know, we support missionaries, and we vet them. We usually have them in first. We get an understanding of what their doctrine is, what their mission is, what their goals are. Once we have that, we can get fully behind them, and we can support them. There's 
really no question about that. But by getting to know somebody, you can vet them, you can remove any uncertainty that would cause you to be concerned. So we'll keep going, keep going here. Um, they use great swelling words of vanity. They allure themselves, or they allure through the lust of the flesh, all about the money. They promise liberty, but are themselves corrupt. Verse 20 reminds me of Lot's wife. Almost escaped the pollutions, or the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But as she looked back, was entangled therein, overcame, and her latter end is certainly worse than the beginning. And, you know, think about Lot. He had one solution that would have prevented this whole thing, never going there in the first place, right? But hindsight's twenty twenty. but the lessons we can learn if we just avoid these things to begin with. So by contrast, Jesus doesn't want our end to be worse than the beginning. He wants all men everywhere to know the truth so we can be set free from the bondage of sin. Uh, in contrast to the false preacher that um, Peter refers to here, look at Paul's words in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. He says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Is a false preacher going to do that? No, because anybody paying attention would recognize and say, hey, uh, you shouldn't be doing that, right? But Paul says, look, you know, I am, um, I am pure from the blood of all men. I've done my job. He preached God's word. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul's ministry is summed up right there. He supports Christ, he supports Christ's ministry, and he goes, look, all I've ever done is told people about Christ. And if somebody's doing that, they're not a false preacher, they're not a false teacher, they're a solid supporter of Christ. Paul says, as he was departing to Jerusalem, he says, I have a clean conscience before you all. I have declared unto you all the counsel of God, and I didn't cherry pick things for my own benefit. If anybody could have cherry-picked things for his benefit, John the Baptist could have. John the Baptist could have said, oh, yeah, you know, taking your brother's wife, I guess we'll let it slide this time. Oh, okay, John, come up out of the jail. You'll be fine. But no, he stood firm on God's clear understanding and clear instruction, and he faced the consequence of becoming a martyr. So why is God so angry at false prophets and false teachers? Because they're attempting and sometimes succeeding, at least for a time, to steal away the people of God. He does not want that to happen. He, they're trying to steal away the people that God has purchased with his own blood. And if we think about all that Christ has done for us, it's not something that was cheap. It's not easy. It's very personal, especially to Christ. These false teachers and false preachers and prophets are a personal affront to Christ. So what does he want to do? Destroy them as soon as he can. Um, how can we guard against false prophets and false preachers? By knowing God's word and listening to true godly preachers that have long understood the best they can do is their best to effectively convey God's word. A godly preacher draws from God's word to teach God's word and has a very healthy understanding of his role. He's not the shepherd, he's an under-shepherd. He's pointing others to Christ. He's supporting, he's not trying to oust the good shepherd. Supporting, you know, helping along, pointing people towards the good shepherd, not trying to have a coup and, you know, raise up the sheep. Hey, we're going to get the shepherd out of here. Are you with me? Bah! You know, and it's, it's a foolish thought, but Satan did it, and people continue to do it. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. A true preacher of God will draw his message and teaching from God's word, which includes and encompasses all the contributors to God's word, the prophets, everything that we've you know, included in the Old Testament, the New Testament. A true preacher of God's word isn't going to just park on one thing. Hey, keep giving, you know, prime the pump, give more, the Lord will give it back to you. And, you know, it may make for some quick results, but you can tell right away that that guy's methods and, you know, motives are clearly not good. 
He used prophets to give us his word. He used well-educated people. He used simple people. He even used donkeys. Love that part. All with the express purpose of pointing us to Jesus, who by himself purged our sins. Nobody else can do it. Nobody, you can send your money to him. You can get the, the, the doily. You can put it on the afflicted part of your body. Nothing else is going to work other than trusting Jesus, who by himself purged our sins and is now on the right hand of the majesty on high. I can't compete with that. I don't want to compete with that. It's not my job. Here are some false prophets uh, who tried to. We have, you know, the Hebrews 11 as the hall of faith. Well, there's a hall of shame. I, I Googled it, and it was pretty interesting. Ahab, the Antichrist, Azur, Elimus, Elimus which is uh, Bar-Jesus, Hananiah, Jezebel, Noadiah, Simon, Zedekiah. There's a whole list, and if you go through and look at all these people, you'll see that there's some repetition. You'll see the things they have in common is they're not humble, is they're self-seeking, they want their own. Um, we don't have time to go through it, unfortunately, tonight, but if you want to see an example of a true preacher, look at Peter's sermon recorded in Acts chapter 3. Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 3 is all about Christ. He purposely and repetitively directs the glory back to, uh, back to Christ. He says, Jesus did this, the healing of the man, he says, through his name is the name of salvation. You know, Peter removes himself from it and says, I'm just a tool being used by God to accomplish his work. Whereas other ones might say, hey, follow me, follow me. Peter says, or Paul says, really, follow me as I follow Christ. So read um, Acts chapter 3, and you'll see it. It's a true preacher. He endures, his message abides, and fruit is evident. Um, if we you know, look a little bit further here, you can see that he continues to give all glory to God, even when faced with challenging times. He realized he could have been you know, on the path to easy street if he was willing to change his message, but was he willing to change his message? Absolutely not. A true preacher has been with Jesus and preaches in the name of Jesus. Um, I'll, just, I'll read this part and then we'll wrap it up. Verse 13 and uh, verse 17 of Acts chapter uh, four, 3. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Uh, verse 17, but, but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than God, judge ye. For we cannot speak but the things which we have seen and heard. Peter wasn't going to take the off-ramp and say, oh, well, I can't preach in Jesus' name anymore, but hey, follow me instead. He goes, this is very much a uh, we ought to obey God rather than man moment. He goes, and he's speaking to religious people who should have known better. They shouldn't have ever you know, pushed him up against the wall. But those religious leaders themselves they didn't want to recognize Christ. They didn't want to have any part of that. So Peter and John had the message of Jesus, and they were sharing his message and his message alone. There was no room for anything to be added on, anything to be taken apart. It was all about Christ. So back to 2 Peter uh, verse 22, 21 and 22, and we'll see a final warning for false prophets and teachers. The Bible says here, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So we see people, these false prophets, false teachers, false preachers, we see that their end is not good. They're going to be destroyed God almost has like a special spot for them. You want to come against my people? You want to do these things? You can for a short time, but your punishment will be terrible. Your punishment will be continual. Your punishment is, should be discouragement from going down this road any further. And he says, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to its own vomit again. Return to the things they came from. And that's a great note to leave you on. Yeah. Anyway, so what do we learn from this? Two things, really. Pray for your pastors for wisdom and direction. You know, a lot of times pastors will, you know, read something and say, oh, that sounds really good. And even pastors can get, you know, pulled away on some things. There's 
you know, the, the new doctrine of the age, there's always a new doctrine that people come up with, or, you know, little nuances, and if you're not careful, or if you get drawn away by somebody's personality, or, you know, maybe they're, uh, you know, very dynamic and they draw you in, it's very easy to do that. So pray for your pastors for wisdom and direction, and perhaps more importantly, pray for these false prophets. Pray for them to repent while there's still time, because I would never want to be like the angel reserved in dark, darkness in chains until the day of judgment. I don't want to face that kind of judgment ever. And hopefully these false teachers and preachers and prophets, hopefully if they have some common sense knocked into them, they'll realize the error of their ways and they'll come out and say, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And that way folks can be reconciled back to Christ where they should be to begin with. So let's pray and we'll uh, jump into our uh, prayer request and praise time. Father, we thank you for uh, this evening. We just pray that you'd help us to be very careful who we listen to um, for, for truth. Father, your word is the final truth. We should be listening to that first and foremost. But there's many uh, voices out there, many speakers, many preachers, many teachers. Help us to have discernment about who to listen to and help uh, make it very clear to us right away uh, who is for you and who is against you. Father, for those that are for you, I pray that you would strengthen their ministries, that you'd give them a, uh, a mouthpiece that they could share your word with others. If there is someone that's speaking against you intentionally, I pray that you would remove them and remove them right quickly, giving them the chance to reconcile, but ultimately showing them that their destruction is near. Father, uh, we just thank you for this time, and we ask for uh, a good remainder of the service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.